thing and share my screen. Come over here. And again, we're going to grade the uh, all these problems in class. Each problem is going to be worth two points. And please either uh, full credit or zero credit on each problem. I have my two terminal windows open here both into the SQL quiz folder. I have this quiz2.sql file uh, in this folder. And if we open it up and get that thing to go away, then we have our problems down here inside of Vimnow that we will go over. Down here on the bottom, let's uh, let's just run Docker PS first. Okay, we have some things uh, running. Here is my SQL quiz right here. Let's connect with PSQL. And now we are ready to run our problems. Problem number one. Um, <clears throat> This one is not actually selecting from the tables in any way. We have select statements that uh, have no from clauses. Whenever you have a select statement without a from clause, then the column list right here, in this case, just a single column, is going to be what is uh, a single row containing that single column. So this select right here gives me just this apple and this select right here gives me just this apple. And the accept all uh, clause connects two tables. So this one on the right and this one on the left using a um, sort of set difference operation like uh, everything in here except or minus everything in here. And uh, so when we run these two things, if this row is equal to this row, then it will uh, delete it and not keep it. Um, but in this case, those two rows are different because SQL is case sensitive on all of the values. Uh, so Apple and Apple are not the same when they're inside single quotation marks. Um, outside of single quotation marks, SQL is case insensitive everywhere. Inside of single quotation marks, SQL is case insensitive. And so just selecting the number of rows from that uh, little table there gives us a one. Any questions on that first problem? Number two. A little bit more complicated up here. Let's go ahead and do the set no number down here. We've got, in this case, we're doing this not in pattern with a subquery. Right here is my subquery. You always want to understand what your subquery is doing before you try to understand the outer query. And in this case, so we're selecting all the IDs from basket B where it matches this pattern down here. Let's go ahead real quick, just select all the IDs from basket B, see what we're uh, looking with, working with, and we'll actually select star from basket B to see what we're working with. And so the fruit B column down here has to I like a percent. So there's no glob before the A over here, no glob before the A. So the A must be the very first letter of the word over here. Um, so those are candidates. This A right here, not a candidate because it's not the first letter of the word. And the I over here is case insensitive. Um, by default, the like operator without an I is case sensitive. So um, the ordinary like operator, operator would not match Apple, but I like is insensitive. So it does match Apple. And so when I run that like this, uh, oops, and uh, when I run the actual Thing. There we go. There's the semicolon. Then I get those are the only two IDs there matching the, the two apples. And now I have to select everything from basket A where the ID is not in that list right there. Let's go ahead and real quick select everything from basket A just to see what we're working with. Basket A, select star from basket A like this. And so the ones and the twos right here, we know those are in the list. And so we're not going to include those in our final output. Uh, but also because the not in is syntactic sugar for the equals um, operator and operators on null values always simplify to null. Uh, this null values right here, these are like in English, they are not in our subquery right here, but in SQL, um, 
they are not not in the subquery, which is not the same as that they are in the subquery. And uh, so when I uh, run this, we'll first do a select star, select star from the basket A with that filter, you will see that the IDs have to in fact exist, not be null. And so we only get three and four. Um, and when we do the count distinct on the fruit A, doo -doo 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 -doo, let's go ahead and start with, what if we did a count star here? Well, there's two, two rows right here, so that would give me two. But when I change that star to a fruit A, it matters whether the column is null or not like this. And so there, one of those columns was null. That one goes away because we don't count the null columns when they put the column up here. And because there's only one thing in here, the distinct actually won't affect things at all. And the final answer is one for problem number two. A lot of things going into that problem there. Any questions on problem number two? Okay, number three, I think the hardest one on the quiz. Um, we've got the left join going on here and we have a relatively complicated join condition. This is the sort of join condition that I have seen in real life and uh, that uh, all of the sort of heuristics that people talk about about left joins uh, don't work, at least in my head about this. And so the actual, um, uh, actually going to the definition is the only thing that at least works for me to figure out what's going on here. So that's what we will do. So uh, again, anytime you have a left join, that is always going to be the, um, the inner join plus some other stuff. So here, just real quick run the inner join gets four rows. So we know our number must be at least four because uh, it's the inner join plus some other stuff. What exactly is this inner join containing here? Do, do, do. There it is. So all the uh, rows where the IDs were null in both of these columns over here uh, is what our inner join is giving us. And then we are going to do a union all with a relatively complicated-ish statement. Uh, everything inside of do, 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 select star from basket A, everything inside of basket A, except all that is not in our original join up here. So the, the left join is the inner join plus all the stuff in the uh, leftmost table here that is not inside the inner join. In order to make uh, this actually line up, we need to do a... Uh, so if we just run uh, this query as it is, we'll see that we get two columns instead of four columns. So we'll need to add our uh, nulls, comma, null, comma, null, like that. Run that right here, put in the semicolon, and then let's run this thing as well. And we'll take a look at what is and what is not inside. Um, so this, I just reformatted my terminal windows here a little bit. This top one, it corresponds to the uh, everything that's in basket A. This bottom one down here corresponds to everything that uh, is uh, in, uh, let's see, I'm just gonna recopy and paste things. So here's everything in basket A. Here's everything from my uh, uh, my inner join. And I have to select or I have to remove all of the columns up here that are down here. And so uh, we do in fact consider the uh, these nulls as uh, important things to check against. So this row right here, null cucumber, null, null, that matches this row right here. So we are going to remove this uh, row right here. And uh, similarly, this null, 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 null row right here matches this one right here. So we will remove this row as well. All of these other rows that have a, um, 
yeah. these rows like this. Uh, they, they will not get removed. And so we will keep those rows. Rerunning all of that together, just to verify, uh, we kept all of the rows that had the IDs over here and did not keep any of the rows that had the null ID. Now we're ready to run it all together, this entire thing, which is equivalent to our uh, actual left join. Again, let's just remind ourselves the inner join had these four things inside of it. The left join had these, or the second part of the left join had these five things inside of it. So hopefully our final thing has nine, four plus five, and yes, it does. There we go, nine things. Nine is the answer for problem number three. A lot of, I don't know, confusing steps in there. Confusing because there's a lot of things to keep track of on each step. Um, but any questions about the idea of problem number three? Okay, the last problem then, problem number four. Four, here we have the natural join going on. And again, the natural join is not a different type of join. It's just syntactic sugar for automatically selecting the join columns for us. And so this natural join is the same as select count star from basket A. And I'll format it the same. Right join basket B, and then with the using clause and automatically putting in our columns here that are the same between basket A and basket B, backslash D, basket A, we have an ID and a fruit A column, backslash D, basket B, we have an ID and a fruit B column. The only columns that are the same are the ID column. So up here, we put ID inside the using clause. These two queries are the same. And rather than desugaring it, I'm just gonna go ahead and run it and we'll take a look and we get a nine as well. And if you go through the actual steps, the rows are totally different. They just happen to both be equal to nine. Any questions on problem number four or three or two or one or anything else? Okay, two points apiece. Total up your score and pass it up to me. Anything else? Okay. okay, today we have a couple announcements for us real quick and then technical stuff. So first thing is uh, no class at all on Friday. And uh, I will still be available at the, at the normal times if people have questions, um, but uh, I will just be in my, my office. So if you would like to ask questions about homework or just sit and work on homework, then that would be the place to come. Uh, we probably won't totally finish the material for uh, in the notes today. Um, uh, I always think it's going to go super fast, but then it always takes a lot longer than I think. Um, but you don't really, uh, the material today helps with the, the Pachilla homework assignment that you have this week, but it's not strictly necessary. And so if we finish up a little bit on Monday, I'm okay with that. Uh, we have a bunch of upcoming assignments due next week. The, the main first one is Pachilla homework three. And I don't think I had the, uh, the sub module linked up here yet last time, but it's available now. You can go click on that and get started. Um, most of the problems are very similar to the Pagilla one and two problems, but I don't give you any hints about like what tables to connect together or what types of joins and, and things to be using. 
And uh, so you'll just have to sort of, uh, now that you have more understanding of all the concrete techniques, you'll have to just figure out the, uh, the why about using the techniques. And uh, that's uh, what the technical material for today is going to be, is discussing sort of the whys behind uh, uh, each of the techniques instead of the hows. Um, the, your, your midterm as well, those problems will not be providing any hints. So this uh, Pajilla homework three, the problems from this uh, homework are the ones that are gonna be like how the midterm is. Uh, there's two really good quotes that I want us to just uh, talk about for a second related to this. The first one by Fred Brooks from this really famous book, The Mythical Man Month, about uh, software engineering. Um, the, the book is most famous for uh, the idea that adding more people to a software project actually slows down the, the development time of a software project. And he says, uh, show me your code and conceal your tables and I shall continue to be mystified and show me your tables and I won't need your code, it'll be obvious. Um, and uh, that's hopefully the point where you're starting to get about with, or get to with this uh, Pajilla assignment is that it'll, it's starting to get obvious what uh, SQL code you need to do uh, the queries that you're needing to do for the assignment. Um, and then similarly on the same veins uh, from a more famous person, uh, he says that I will in fact claim that the difference between a bad program and a good one is whether he considers his code or his data structures more important. So data structures here being all of the, the tables in the database and how they're formatted. Bad programmers work, worry about the code and good programmers worry about the data structures and their relationships. Um, so the idea is that if you, under, if you know what the tables are in a database, then you can do every, anything that you need to do. You don't need uh, the hints about how things are supposed to connect. Those should be obvious. Some of these problems will have you looking up new techniques um, I would, or require you to use new techniques. I will not be discussing those new techniques in class at all. And my expectation is that uh, you'll be able to look up for yourself what those new techniques are. Those problems that do require new techniques, I will have a link to references for you. And one last thing is that I have posted the homework, but there are uh, one last new technique that I want to add in there that I didn't get have time to do yet. So I'll probably update that homework tonight. Uh, but if I don't get it updated tonight, then you won't have to do those problems and I won't add them at all. Uh, the Twitter homework also due next Tuesday. Uh, hopefully, though, most people are mostly done with this. And then we'll have the quiz next Wednesday on the counting the bytes that each row of a table uses. And the midterm uh, next be, will be posted next Wednesday after class. And I'll make it due uh, that Sunday at midnight. So it's sort of technically during spring break, but would definitely encourage you to finish it before the weekend and not have to worry about it at all over the weekend. I just am definitely not going to look at it before Monday. So um, didn't want to have an artificially shorter, artificially sooner due date. So it's a lot of stuff due next week. Um, Probably all classes are that way before spring break, getting things in. I apologize for that. But if you've been uh, good on your uh, Twitter stuff, then it's really the same amount of stuff that we do every week. Um, any questions on anything administrative? OK. Then today, so last time what we talked about, we talked about, again, the disk space usage of uh, individual rows and calculating that concretely. And today we're going to talk a little bit more big picture about uh, different database design decisions. They will, these decisions will relate a little bit back to disk space usage, um, but they're more going back to this style of if you're making good database design decisions, then it'll be obvious how to uh, use your database to accomplish different tasks. And so we're going to discuss a couple of those uh, different patterns and how those patterns manifest themselves in the Pajilla assignment or the Pajilla database um, to give you a better sense of why uh, you might want to be joining and, or doing certain operations on certain tables. 
Um, so there's the row overhead. We talked about all of this and we're down here into this redundant data section. So database normalization. The main idea of data, database normalization is that it's a way of uh, reducing redundant data in your database that uh, the typical business sort of uh, person wants a denormalized uh, representation. The, uh, often the user of a database wants a denormalized representation, um, but for various reasons, it's usually more efficient or useful to store things in a normalized form. We talked a little bit about the difference between denormalization and normalization with arrays, that arrays are an example of denormalizing uh, things. And um, we'll be a little bit more concrete uh, on this today. Um, so first, some high level things before we get into more concrete details. So the key thing that makes a relational database or RDBMS relational is the fact that you can do this normalization. And um, this other class of databases, NoSQL databases are non-relational. And so they don't really have support for normalization. And that really means what it, uh, boils down to is they don't have good support for joins. Uh, SQL Postgres has really good support for joins. And again, after spring break, we'll be talking about the different algorithms that Postgres does for joins and how to make those actually efficient. Um, but for now, um, it's just the fact that it has it and that we know how to use it is the important thing. Normalization uh, from a database person's perspective is always more correct, that it always makes the database somehow more beautiful, um, but there's sometimes a performance trade-off for doing that. So the reason people like NoSQL is, uh, can be a little bit faster potentially than, uh, than Postgres. And by faster, I mean faster by a constant factor and not asymptotically faster. Uh, Postgres will be guaranteed to be asymptotically fast on, uh, on on anything that you could possibly do with it. Um, the normalization also will always store less real data, but because of the various metadata, it might have uh, more overhead that, uh, that it has to store. And so it might take up more space to do things normalized. Actually selecting like what level of normalization or denormalization you use is a sort of uh, complicated engineering problem. And uh, CTOs of, get, of big companies, why they get uh, paid a lot is because they know how to find the right balance between these two things. So from a theoretical perspective, there's um, something called a normal form that databases use. And there's 11 different normal forms that Wikipedia knows about. Uh, in like, if you look into research papers, there's even more that uh, people publish about. And if this were a database course, uh, we would be spending a lot of time going over these normal forms in detail. I remember when I was uh, an undergrad in a database course, and uh, we probably spent like a month just talking about different normal forms and their technical properties. And then uh, that was in 2007 for me, and I have never heard anybody talk about normal forms since then. Um, so that's why we're not going to talk about those at all. Uh, this is like a strictly theoretical thing that uh, academic people care about, but never used in the real world. So uh, we will skip over all of those details and talk about the actual like practical things that people care about. Uh, <clears throat> The first of those practical things is something called views. Um, the right way to think about a view in Postgres or SQL in general is that this is like, this is the correct way of doing functions. We've talked a little bit about functions in your first Pajilla assignment. Um, and uh, it turns out that those types of functions are not uh, very efficient, uh, but views are very efficient. And a view, I have this link right here to create view.sql. <laughs> if you click it, it comes up here. You can see that inside this create view statement, there's just this big complicated SQL statement with a bunch of things joined together. And uh, uh, a view is just a short, a short name for a, a, a select statement. So it's like a, a subquery, but the subquery has a name that you can reference it uh, wherever you like to, and you don't have to copy and paste this whole subquery wherever you'd like to use it. 
This particular payment denormalized table right here, I'm gonna, uh, or this uh, payment denormalized view, I'll jump over, not there, here uh, to a, uh, a Pajilla, uh, uh, I'm in a PSQL session right now with Pajilla. I've just ran, run this create view on payment denormalized right here. And if I do a something like select star from payment denormalized, then it gives me all the information from all of those uh, tables. This is uh, uh, what a typical customer who is using the Pajilla database would be looking at. And by customer, I don't mean like the person walking into Blockbuster to rent a movie. I mean like the, the person who is the customer of the database. So the person who's sitting behind the counter and uh, uh, interacting with the database as a user, but not a uh, technical person. And what they're interested in is they're having, well, so, so first of all, again, this is the pager environment in the, the terminal. Anytime you run a, a select statement and it gives you too much information, this is the pager environment. The way the pager environment works is that it defaults to giving you this sort of weird uh, layout where one line, what I would call one logical line of the table is displayed in uh, multiple lines down here. If I zoomed way out, we'd get it in a normal, nice formatting. Uh, but as soon as you start uh, scrolling left or right, then it takes you into the nice formatting, something that looks kind of like an Excel spreadsheet. And uh, this is the sort of thing that the, the person who is a user of the database is, is really interested in. They want to maybe look up somebody's, uh, uh, their name, somebody by their name, and figure out what are the actual movies, what's the list of all the movies that they've uh, ever rented. Or um, so here's the titles and um, the person's uh, names. So we could do something like that. Select star from payment denormalized. Uh, let's just do an order by last name right here. So we get this person, Raphael Abney, and here's all of the, uh, the titles of movies that they have. Um, that they have uh, rented and they don't have to be thinking about joins and how this is implemented under the hood. Uh, if you're using one of these NoSQL databases, then this is exactly how the information would be represented. You just have this one uh, table, no joins going on. And uh, uh, so it's the same both from a user's and the database programmer's perspective. The downside of this though, is there is a lot of redundant information going on. You can see here, for example, this address here of our uh, Raphael Abney person is stored many, many times in this view. And so if we were having to store this table exactly as it is, then um, we'd be wasting a lot of space storing this address many, many times. We would also be, uh, if ever, Raphael Abney moves to a new location and we need to update the address, then we'd have to update it in many locations instead of just one. And it would be a lot of extra work on in Python, for example, making sure that all of those, uh, all of those updates are correct. So the, the normalized representation, uh, the main advantages of it are that you don't have to do that extra work and you are not, uh, um, uh, you're not storing a whole bunch of redundant information. There's a lot of patterns in doing this normalization and this other considerations down here, we're gonna think about all of those different patterns, seeing examples of how the Pajilla database actually does those patterns. And hopefully that will give you a better sense of how the database works and is put together so that you'll be able to answer the Pajilla homework assignments better or more easily. Any questions at this point? Okay. Yeah, so there's maybe a, I don't know, from a student's perspective at this point, a slight danger in that um, everything that we're gonna talk about next and or that we've talked about so far today, everything we're talking about today, there's not, it's not directly on the midterm in any way. It's not directly on any of the, these quizzes. Um, I'm never going to like uh, ask you what is the unique constraint and provide me a definition, 
Um, so there's the tenant or temptation to zone out at this point and not pay attention to what's going on. Um, but the uh, going forward from here on out, I'm going to be assume that you have good familiarity with all this stuff. And so when we're talking about uh, all the different algorithms and things, uh, again, after spring break and uh, how these constraints affect them, uh, I'm just going to be assuming that you have this familiarity that we're going over today. So again, this is not going to be tested directly, anything that we're going over today, but it will be background information that you'll need for things that will be tested directly later. So to go over this material under this other considerations and database design, uh, there's uh, the main points uh, that you'll want to make sure you have a good understanding of after today's lecture are the things under this bullet point one right here. Um, and uh, we're not going to go over this bullet point one sort of just step by step. Instead, down here below, there's this common table structures section. And as we encounter all of those bullet points from part one up above, coming discussing the common table structures, I'll go back up to bullet point one and uh, discuss um, how that thing up here relates to what we're talking about. Um, so this is like the reference section right here. This is the reference of things that you definitely will want to uh, know. Uh, uh, but we're not going to talk about it just all at once. This entity relationship diagram. Um, so before we get to the the section three down here, the common table structures, the entity relationship diagram. This is the uh, the diagram that we're looking at in the Pajilla database. So get uh, Mike and Becky, Pajilla homework. This uh, diagram right here, the name for this diagram is the entity relationship diagram. Again, each one of these uh, boxes is a table. Each one of these uh, words inside the box is a column. And the star on a box or a star on a column represents a primary key. We're going to be talking about um, exactly what all of these lines mean and uh, how to interpret this based on these common table structures and uh, those uh, reference links up above. The one caution that I have for you all is that there are these standard uh, linkings down here and these symbols about what they mean. There is no way to automatically enforce these though. These are not something that's like actually represented in the SQL code. This is something that is like documentation. And like all documentation, it is easy to uh, be out of date. And the, uh, the links, these symbols in the uh, Pajilla diagram are often wrong. So I wouldn't trust the symbols in the Pajilla diagram. Where did the Pajilla diagram go? I wouldn't trust exactly what these symbols over here mean. Um, but the lines themselves are all actually correct. Those can be generated from a, a machine uh, system. Um, the Pajilla database is a reasonably large database. It's got uh, about 20 different tables inside of it. So it's non-trivial, but this is not at all like what a real world uh, database looks like. That over here, uh, this link to a, a real world database at this uh, vocal company. Uh, if you click on that, this is what a standard, like a typical small business uh, database is gonna look like. Uh, by small tech business, I mean like, I don't know, 10 to 50-ish programmers working. You can see there's 100 different tables and all these links all over the place. And uh, this is, again, the thing that if you are Linus Torvalds or the author of the Mythical Man Month, somebody hands this to you about how their system works and you don't care, you don't need to see any of their SQL code or their Python code. You can just infer from this uh, what it all is what everything is doing. Um, but as you can see, I mean, it's super complicated. So uh, not the sort of thing that people just like can instantly understand. Um, okay, on to the common table structures. There's a different, many different types of relationships that things can have with each other. And people use these terms in a lot of different ways. Uh, they're, I don't know, database people try to define all these things very formally, but they're never actually used formally in practice. 
So um, I'm not defining them formally. I'm just going to give a bunch of examples to give us intuition about these types of relationships. And so this first one is a one-to-one -one relationship between things. And for each of these types of relationships that we'll see, we'll talk about denormalized representations and normalized representations of those relationships, seeing some examples inside of the, uh, the Pagilla uh, database, and again, how those examples relate to the references up above that you have to know about. So an example of a one-to-one -one relationship is that every film is going to have exactly one title here. And uh, that can be represented in uh, this uh, form here that we have just a film table. Each row of the film table can, it corresponds to a particular film. But the film ID is what actually uniquely identifies a film. Um, and then we have a title down here. And there's this, uh, there's a number of uh, constraints being added on to this title. The not null constraint is, uh, I mean, we've seen this before, it just means that you can't insert something into the film and have it be null. Every film must have a title. Um, so the not null just means no null values inserted. The unique constraint is a little bit weird in that uh, it means, well, I guess what it's doing is not weird. It just means you can't have duplicate titles. Um, the implementation uh, details of the unique constraint, unique constraint are weird, and we will be uh, going over that extensively after spring break. Uh, has a lot of performance implications. Uh, in this particular uh, setup, in this particular business application, it is a little bit weird to have a unique constraint on the title of your film because a lot of there are a lot of films actually that share titles. That if you have like remakes of movies. Um, they'll often have the same exact title. The only difference will be the, uh, the year that they're released. And so this is probably not actually a very good um, business logic constraint right here, this unique constraint. Probably not good from a business perspective. Uh, but it is useful just to illustrate uh, that the idea of this sort of like one-to-one -one relationship. Any questions so far? Another sort of more complicated one-to-one -one, uh, constraint is for a customer. Uh, the uh, Pagilla assignment or the Pagilla database splits the name of customers into first names and last names. And it's requiring that so they both be uh, not null right here. You'll notice there's no unique constraint on the first name and last name individually, but there is a unique constraint on the first name and last name taken together as a pair. So this lets two people have the same first names, like two uh, Sallies and then two Smiths, but uh, Sally Smith, you can't have two Sally Smiths. Uh, this right here is not equivalent to having unique on both of these two columns individually. Uh, there's a very common pattern of things to do, applying unique constraints to multiple uh, columns at the same time. <laughs> And uh, at this point, for the semantics of the, uh, what the unique constraint does, the column order here does not matter from a semantic perspective. Uh, but this is going to be one of the things where it'll have a huge, a huge implication from a performance perspective. Um, so again, when we talk about performance, the column names will, or the order will matter. Uh, but at this point, the order does not matter. As another uh, side, in the real world, if you're storing people's names, a uh, common mistake is to break it up uh, in your database into a first name field and last name field because most Americans have first names and last names. Uh, but most people around the world do not have first names and last names that uh, people from Spain, for example, have uh, typically four or five last names, what we would think of as last names. And people in other cultures might have only a single name. Um, so the standard correct way to store names in a database is just a single name field that can account for uh, whatever type of text somebody wants to enter. Um, another example of a um, uh, um, uh, was this, the one-to-one -one constraints here in the payments is that, uh, whoops, and here this, um, um, uh, this is a typo. This was meant to be in the next section down there. So we'll skip over this part C right here. 
Um, so these are denormalized representations. Again, when you think about denormalized, things are somehow being combined into a single table. And the normalized representation is when we have uh, things combined or uh, spread out into multiple tables. So uh, every rental, a rental is an instance of somebody actually renting a movie from our store. And then a payment is an instance of somebody uh, making that payment. And here they have split out the rental and payment into two uh, separate tables. Um, there's not a good business logic reason for doing that or a good implementation reason for doing that. It's just to illustrate uh, a different way of storing information. The payment information here has two things, the, uh, the amount that the person paid and a payment date right here. Um, there has to be exactly or at most one payment for the rentals here because in this unique constraint, we also have a references uh, rental right here. What this references rental means is that every payment row, uh, whatever this rental ID, it must exist inside of this rental table up here. So this constraint up here, uh, the references is also called a foreign key constraint. This references foreign key constraint forces us to never insert something where uh, the rental ID doesn't match up here. And then the unique constraint means that we can't have more than one uh, payment for the same rental ID. These uh, foreign key constraints right here, this references up right here, uh, these correspond to the lines in the uh, entity relationship diagram up here. Everywhere where you see one of these lines, it indicates a uh, foreign key uh, between the two tables. It's very, uh, depending on the software used to generate these constraints uh, or these uh, tables, some, some software tries to make the lines kind of uh, match up between what columns on the left-hand side matches to what columns on the right-hand side. Uh, but this... Uh, uh, this diagram doesn't match up that way. These lines, though, are machine generated. Uh, we can, we can uh, enforce that these lines are correct in the diagrams because they come directly from the, uh, the SQL code. Over here it comes directly from this references. Typically, when you have a references column of something from somewhere to somewhere else, this is a great column to do a join on. Um, uh, whether it's a left join or an inner join that you'll want to be doing, there's no way to know from just the SQL itself. Um, but when you're when you have columns that reference tables, that's typically the uh, the columns to join on. Um, in general, well, let's see. So there's another way that we could represent this. I think I have it. Yes. No. Uh, we can represent this normalized representation in a denormalized form by combining this numeric uh, amount in this timestamp payment date as entries in this rental table up here. This uh, modified rental table right here is showing that, that now we have the uh, uh, amount and the payment date right here inside of this rental table. Um, this table at this point, though, is a little bit different than this up here, because up here we have, because we have these not null constraints, whenever we have an amount for a particular rental, we must also have a payment date for that same rental up here. Down here, uh, uh, we have no null constraints here, so uh, it's possible for only one of these to be null and the other one not to be null. If we added not null constraints right here, then it would force that we always have a payment for every rental. That's also different. Having no null constraint right here means that one of these can be null when the other one is not null. So this right here is different than this up here from a semantic perspective. We can make the semantics the same by adding this idea of a check constraint. A check constraint is an arbitrary if condition that every row in the table must satisfy. So down here, uh, what this uh, check constraint is doing is saying that if the amount is null, then the payment uh, must also be null. Or if the amount is not null, then the, uh, the payment date must also be not null. Uh, so this check constraint 
combined with this uh, denormalized representation is equivalent to this normalized representation up here. The, um, yeah, so the semantics are equivalent. For uh, most people using databases, this representation is easier to understand uh, because it's all contained in the create table statements like this. Check constraints. Check constraints cannot be added directly to a create table statement. And uh, you have to first create the table and then alter the table. And so this makes the, I don't know, the uh, understanding a little bit harder because it's uh, just multiple sections of the code that you have to look at and understand. Um, but the performance implications are uh, pretty big that this uh, is going to be much, much faster than uh, the normalized representation. And uh, we also already can see that the disk space used by this will uh, be less than the disk space used by this, because up here, every row in payment has a corresponding row in rental, and every row we've seen has an overhead of 24 bytes at least. And uh, so we're having, by representing it this way, we're paying a 24 byte penalty per row in the payment table. By representing it this way, we're not paying that 24 byte penalty. Um, any questions? Okay. Um, in my opinion, the Pajilla table is pretty excessively normalized, um, and things could be made a lot faster. Use less data by uh, denormalizing a lot of uh, a lot of these locations. Uh, but again, it's it's just for educational purposes to show you the different possible techniques of representing or possible methods of representing these uh, relationships. The next of these relationships is a one to many relationship. And the standard um, uh, denormalized representation of this is in an array. So previously, every film had one title, um, but every film can have multiple special features. And so we've talked before about how to use uh, arrays to do something like that. And the, the normalized version is uh, splitting off the array into its uh, uh, own separate table. Uh, so here, this uh, inventory is a separate table that is based off of the film. And it has this foreign key inside of it, a single foreign key referencing film. So this means that one film, one film can have many rows corresponding to the inventory table. And there's no unique constraint down here, whereas previously uh, with our foreign key, we did have a unique constraint. The one-to-one -one between film and inventory would have a unique constraint. The one-to-many between film and inventory has no unique constraint here. Um, and this is a very, very common pattern. Um, one of the so again, uh, arrays, not a standard SQL feature. The standard way of representing one-to-many, uh, according to the SQL standard, is that you have to do it this way. Um, the arrays, uh, more efficient, though, if you only have a single column that you have to have one-to-many with because you don't have the overhead of the 24 bytes per row. If you have many columns that you need, so like here we have a store ID and a film ID inside of our inventory. Um, so there are uh, uh, multiple things that we need to be keeping track of for each uh, film. That is not possible to do with an array. An array is only for if there's one, uh, one column. Uh, this normalized representation is for if there are multiple columns. Um, so every uh, customer can have multiple rentals. Every store can have multiple staff. There are many, many of these one-to-many representations inside of the Pajilla database. Disadvantages of the denormalized representation. So again, array is not a SQL standard feature, so not supported in MySQL, MS SQL. Uh, they do have support in Oracle. Uh, it's usually not a problem though, because uh, it's very rare for you need to be able to need to write SQL that supports multiple databases. Um, but if you do need to support multiple databases for whatever reason, you can't use arrays. Uh, again, you can only have a single column in the array. Um, uh, they're a little bit confusing to work with though, because you should always use the unnest function. If you uh, followed the, the links 
that I had uh, previously about arrays, they showed some other functions that you could use. Um, there's a lot of potential for unexpected uh, runtime explosions from constant time up to linear time, though, if you use functions other than unnest with arrays. And uh, uh, if you check out this link right here, they'll tell uh, talk about how they accidentally took down their website by not understanding the, the runtime implications of, um, of arrays versus uh, the normalized representation. Um, but if you always use the unnest function, then you will always be good. The advantage of the denormalized representation, the main advantage is just the, uh, the smaller disk space usage. I thought about forcing you to on the quiz next week to be able to calculate how many uh, how much disk usage an array uses, but you won't have to do that. Uh, it's just the overhead is uh, 24 bytes uh, per array over overall, whereas the overhead for the normalized version is the 24 bytes um, uh, per row. Um, uh, so the, the overhead is, is, is potentially much less using array if you have very large values. Even more important, though, is that this idea of toasting and compressing in Postgres, this can happen automatically on uh, individual columns only. And so it can happen if you use an array. A large array will be toasted and compressed, but the normalized version, no matter how large it is, won't be toasted and compressed. Um, so that could potentially result in orders of magnitude space savings. Uh, takeaway is if you can use arrays, you probably want to use arrays. Um, uh, but if you can't, and the reason you can't is because you have multiple columns that you need uh, to be able to work with in your one-to-many representation, then you should be using uh, this setup right here. It's never wrong to use this setup right here. Uh, any questions about that? Yes, maybe one of our, I don't know, or at least it's seeming like from everybody's perspective, one of our more boring lectures, but uh, um, hopefully that it will help with the background on the Pajilla assignments a little bit. Um, the many-to-many -many relationships, next common one. Here you should think about a bipartite graph. And um, so a graph where you have two sort of categories of nodes and then edges connecting them. Uh, so the film to actor tables is the uh, the way the main way this shows up in your homework assignments or in the Pajilla. And we have the film table and the actor table. Every film can have many actors in the film, and every actor can have uh, appear in many films. And so the way that you have to connect these two pieces of information together, the way that you connect these two tables together is an intermediate table. Um, then this intermediate table represents the edges between these two tables out here. This intermediate table is almost always just uh, like has no real information inside of it. It just has foreign keys into the uh, one foreign key into the first set of nodes, one foreign key into the second set of nodes. And then the primary key is uh, the, the unique or the combination of uh, the IDs from both of these two tables. Again, the primary key, it is only means that unique and not null. So this is equivalent to both of these two things cannot be null. And the combination of these two things must be unique. So again, the order of this will be significant later on when we talk about performance. At this point, though, the order doesn't matter. There's a couple of um, uh, locations this comes up in the, um, uh, the Pachilla assignment. The main one, the one that I think uh, comes up in this Pachilla 3 homework a lot is the film to actor relationship right here. Um, and uh, uh, but there's also a customer to film. Every customer can rent multiple films, and every film can be rented by most multiple customer customers. And so the rental and inventory tables together sort of act as the connecting table. You can expect that since this is going to be on the uh, the Pajilla three homework, that this one down here, some interesting queries relating to these will be on the midterm. 
Uh, finally, uh, so these are bipartite graph structures. You can represent general graph structures as well. This is typically done with actually a single table that references itself. So here you see the, the references right here. And the key thing about this reference, and I don't know if I mentioned this before, but after references is the table name, then the column name. The table name right here uh, goes to itself. And uh, then the employee ID right here. This gives you a arbitrary uh, graph structure having this uh, referencing itself. <laughs> Turns out that uh, any of your classic graph algorithms like depth first search, breadth first search, Dijkstra's algorithm, Prim's algorithm, A star, traversals, they can all be implemented with uh, optimal asymptotic efficiency using uh, something called a recursive circle SQL query. And uh, this is a pretty advanced uh, SQL concept. Uh, I wouldn't expect recursive SQL queries to come up on uh, like SQL interviews, um, but uh, uh, being able to pull that out of your hat at a SQL interview would be like guaranteed to impress anybody who that you're uh, uh, interviewing with. And this is something that you will have to look up and figure out how to do for your uh, Pagilla 3 homework. Uh, but if you're using a recursive SQL query or the situations where you might want to use a recursive SQL query are anytime you're talking about graph structures and the main graph structures that occur in the Pagilla database are these bipartite graph structures. Um, uh, an aside down here, uh, so uh, our relational databases can store graph data just fine, uh, but there is a thing called a graph database that exists and it's designed specifically for this type of graph data. They're generally more efficient by constant factors, uh, not asymptotically, but they lack all the other features of relational databases like joins. And so you really only wanna use them if you know that you have a lot of graph structures. Neo4j is the most uh, famous of those and they have a page talking about the advantages and disadvantages. There's another language called Sparkle, which is uh, inspired by SQL. The S and the QL come from SQL. The PAR uh, is just added there to make it uh, look cool. And I don't know, it's a backronym to something, uh, but Sparkle is the language for querying uh, graph databases specifically. Uh, we're not going to get to talking about Sparkle in this class, uh, but one of the nice things about Postgres is that you can add extensions to it, and Postgres does have extensions for Sparkle queries. Uh, so everything that a graph database can do, Postgres can do. Um, it'll just maybe have a like a constant factor overhead. The yeah some interesting references for database design. Uh, I don't know. I don't think we need to, I'm not going to go over any of these in particular, but if you're actually like setting out to build your own company database or something, these are the, these would be good references to uh, uh, look at to make sure that you avoid common pitfalls. Um, any questions about anything? Okay, my sense is that everybody's ready to be done for the day, so we'll end early, and um, I'll be around if people have questions about anything. Um, and again, no class on Friday, but I'll be available on Friday for... Uh, uh, if anybody does have questions about the homework or anything else, otherwise, I'll see you all on Monday. Um. We use the uh...